Have you tried the Gilded Rose refactoring carter? Because a lot of people have, and I've seen a lot of solutions to it over the years. But I would say that at least 90% of them are frankly doing it wrong. People spend ages creating unit tests for the code before they begin refactoring. And often the tests turn out to be not that good. The worrying thing is that means that when they're faced with real legacy code, they'll do it the same way, badly. I mean, you do need tests when you refactor legacy code. You need good ones, ones that stand up well against Kent Beck's test desiderata. In this video, I am going to demonstrate the best way to write tests for Gilded Rose and prove it with the test desiderata. Hi, I'm Emily Bache. I'm a software developer and creator of Saman Coaching. Do take a look around the content on my channel and subscribe so you get all the updates. If you enjoy the video today, please hit like. And note, you can support me and my work with all my code carters via Patreon. Kent Beck invented his test desiderata to explain what tests should be like. And I explained them in a previous video about how they apply to approval tests. Now these desiderata describe desirable properties that you'd like tests to have. But in many cases, there's a trade-off. You can't get all of them at once. So if you find yourself giving up one of the desirable properties, you should expect to gain another of equal or more value in exchange. In this video, I'm gonna use these desiderata to explain why my approach is the best way to write tests for Gilded Rose. But first, let me show you the usual way that people do this. Daniel Steinberg is a very good developer, and he has published a detailed account of his solution to Gilded Rose in 42 parts. There's a link to it in the show notes. He is absolutely painstaking about adding tests for every single one of the Gilded Rose business rules. And I'm showing the state of his code after lesson 18, when he's created a load of tests and he's about to begin the refactoring part of the exercise. Daniel has used the Gilded Rose requirements document, which describe this fantasy world where magical items react in unusual ways to the passing of time. This description is Incomplete, confusing, and vague. Real life requirements may not be for fantasy objects, but otherwise incomplete, confusing, and vague requirements is a very realistic aspect of this exercise. So Daniel goes through these very carefully and writes tests. This is an example. The quality of the item is never negative. That's the business rule. Normally the quality of items decreases every day, but there's a limit, zero. So he's written this test that constructs an item with quality zero, he updates it and checks the quality is still zero and wasn't decreased. This looks to me like a well-written unit test. It's got a good name, good use of helper functions, a state-of-the-art fluent assertion, and it does work actually. It will find your refactoring mistakes. The trouble is you need an awful lot of tests like this to cover the Gilded Rose functionality. There are a lot of business rules. It's actually difficult to work out how to test each one separately. I've drawn this picture that shows all of the things that can vary and influence the outcome, drawn as three axes that rules depend on. To completely cover all the business rules, you'd need to write tests for all of the combinations of interesting values. And it's only by studying the requirements that you realize that some of these combinations are not possible. Uh, for example, Brie and backstage items don't get a quality below zero. They don't decrease like that. So actually to test this rule about quality going below zero, just one test with a normal item is enough. And that's one reason why Daniel's 25 tests are so impressive. He's picked out only the relevant combinations and tested them well. It took him ages. Back to the test desiderata. One of these is composability. This is a desirable aspect of both the tests and the design of the software. What it means, if your tests are composable, you don't need to have a different test for every single combination. You can test one aspect at a time and you need far fewer tests. The trouble is, if your software design is not composable, you won't easily be able to write composable tests for it. And that's what Daniel and others have found here with the Gilded Rose code. It's a tangled mess of business rules, and it's really hard to write composable unit tests for it. What we would like is the design of the code to be composable, 
with these three axes, item, type, quality, and selling. And then you could write just one test to check this quality is never negative rule. Something like this. I've got this quality boundaries object and I could just apply this to all of the item types that need it. And I wouldn't need to necessarily test all of the combinations. Now that test is taken from a rewrite of the Gilded Rose that I did using test-driven development. My new design is much more composable and I can test all the business rules that Daniel is testing with fewer test cases. I think I've got about 18 tests to his 25. This is unfortunately not the best approach to Gilded Rose. Rewriting legacy code from scratch is a lot of work. I've just shown this test to demonstrate what a composable test might look like. Instead, what I want to do now is actually show you a demo of the best way to write tests for Gilded Rose. I'm starting from this approval test, which is pretty similar to the unit test that comes with this project. All I've done is basically um, replace the assertion with uh, an item printer and approvals verify. So this test works and it passes. And similar to the original unit test that comes with the project, it covers some of the lines of code in this horrible bit of logic. But in order to cover more of these lines, I'm gonna need more variation in the values of the name of the item, the quality of the item, and the sell-in of the item. Um, and that's my goal, really. I wanna try and cover all of this long conditional. So I'm gonna extract variables then for each of these things that I'm gonna to need to vary in order to cover all the lines of code in that piece of code that I want to refactor later. So name, sell-in, and quality as variables. And then I'm going to extract this middle part of the test then as a function. Use my tools to do that. Um, do update quality. And it's noticed that this can be a static function, um, but I'm just going to make it a public normal function, actually. Um, it's, I think, slightly easier to handle. But uh, for this technique that I'm going to show you to work, you do need some kind of um, pure function uh, that doesn't modify remember state between invocations, actually. Uh, so this is a new function. I'm just going to inline that redundant variable there. Cool. So I'm just running my tests again, just to prove this really was a pure refactoring. Um, and then I'm going to make a little commit, I think. It's always good to commit when you're refactoring regularly. So now I'm going to replace this ordinary call to verify with combination approvals, verify all combinations. And you can kind of see from the, the help text here, it, it's... The interface to this is a bit strange. It's got lots of options. So let me explain to you how this works. Basically, the, the first argument here needs to be some kind of pure function that it can call. So that's, that's Java syntax there for a pointer to um, the function do update quality. And then um, the next arguments need to be arrays or that contain values for the arguments to that function. So the do update quality function has three arguments. Uh, for the, the string, the name, and then two integer arguments for the cell-in and the quality. So I can just put those in as arrays, but there's a quirk in the Java language. I'm just going to hopefully be able to fix this quickly. Um, you can't use the primitive integer type here. It gets confused. Um, the auto boxing doesn't work anyway. So we're having to put in the, um, the integer objects here rather than the integer primitives, and then it's happy. OK, so now I can run my test again because this was largely a refactoring. I've just replaced one kind of verify with another. But there is a small difference, so the test has failed. Um, if you look on the right, that's what I approved previously, what my item printer was producing. On the left, that's what I've got now with the combination approvals. And you can see it's added this part at the start, uh, which outlines what were the exact arguments that it sent to the do update quality method. Um, I'm sending in foo, zero, zero, and then I'm getting out foo, minus one, and zero. So uh, things get updated when the update quality method, not the quality, strangely, but anyway. Um, okay, so basically I'm going to approve this. So that, that is not a significant change to this test. It's still basically a refactoring. But it's probably still a good moment to just do a bit of cleanup. I don't need those lines anymore. I should make a little commit. Just run it again, check it passes commit my change. Okay, so I haven't got to the best bit yet. That's coming. 
Um, basically, I want to try and get that coverage up that we were just talking about. In order to get the coverage up, I'm going to need some items with other names like HBRI. And what I do is I put those into the array of names here. And then if I run the test again, it's going to fail because it's now giving an additional line here in the output where it's not doing foo anymore. It's doing age brie, which is the new value for the, the name I just put in. And it acts differently. You see the quality goes up to two. So it's taking a different path through the code, which means I should get more coverage from this test. Um, so I'll just run that again with coverage and see if I can see any difference. Well, yeah, it's not totally obvious. Maybe lines 20 and 21, maybe? I'm not sure. It, it will have made a difference, but I think if I'm really going to make a, a good attempt at getting full coverage, I'm going to need these other names as well. So we'll have backstage passes and so for us. Um, and then we'll run it again. And this time, of course, I'm expecting additional lines in the output because I'm testing more combinations. So there they are, two more lines for two more names of items. And hopefully that will get me more paths through the code. I'm going to approve that. I mean, I'm just approving this because this code works in some sense. Anything it does can be considered correct. So I'm just going to approve whatever it does. And then I'll be, when I'm refactoring, of course, I just want it to keep doing that. Oh yeah, so I've got a few more green lines now, I think. Um, but the next thing I need to cover here, to get those lines, I'm probably going to need a cell in less than zero. Um, so let's try actually putting in something in the array of selling values as well as the zero I already had. Let's try minus one. And actually, now I've inlined those things, I probably should write a little comment so I remember what they are. Um, okay. Let's try running this and have a look. So yeah, so it failed, of course, because I put a new value for one of the combinations. But you can see it didn't just produce one new line in the output. I've actually doubled the number of lines in the output because it had to try that new minus one value with each of the names that I've given it. It's testing all the combinations exhaustively, which should mean I cover more paths through the code um, with very little additional test code, if you've noticed. OK, so that looks all right. I'm going to approve that and then go and have a look at my coverage. Yeah, so running the tests again running them again with coverage. Huh, I didn't get those lines I was hoping to get yet. I think that's because my quality is always zero. Okay, so I've got some more work to do here. I think I've got um, to vary the quality as well as the sell-in and the name. And actually, I'm going to skip over this part and um, to make the video a little shorter. But the basic idea here is I just need to add more combinations and to cover all the lines of code. This is what my test code looks like at the end of all that, when I've tried to find all the combinations I needed to cover the functionality. So including the printer, this is what, 35 lines of code, which is not that much. And the approved file though is a little larger. Um, I've got all of these combinations being tested and it's a total of about 120. Um, so that's not insignificant. But, you know, my computer can handle that. It, the tests still run very quickly. And if I look at the coverage, I've got full line and branch coverage here. So I'm pretty happy with that. I hope you agree with me. That was a much better way to write tests. And I don't know if you noticed, but I didn't look at the requirements once. The diagram that I showed you earlier with these three axes is one I drew afterwards based on these tests. I haven't needed a particularly good understanding of the business rules to get these tests in place. I couldn't actually tell you that only normal items need to check this rule, quality is never negative. I've just tested everything. This test does definitely not exhibit what Kent Beck calls composability in his Desiderata. It tests all the combinations. And Kent has said that with the desiderata, you shouldn't give one up unless you get a different one with more value in exchange. So this test has given up composability, but we have gained writability. This was so much easier to write than composable tests like the ones Daniel wrote. I also wanted to mention that the other approval tests that come with the Carter using text tests work slightly differently, but they're also not composable. 
I've used them to have a small list of items that I run through like 30 times recording the new state. It's actually very similar to the all combination tests I just demoed, but it's a bit more scattered and less efficient. I created it in a similar way though, looking at code coverage and inventing new combinations until I got the coverage I needed. These kinds of combination tests also lose some of the fast desiderata. It takes a long time to brute force your way through all the possible combinations. Computers today though have so much processing power that it isn't such a problem always. For a small problem like this, it's actually still a very fast test. When I've used this technique with real production code in legacy systems, I have actually run into speed problems once or twice. I worked on this one piece of code where we had like 18 factors that the rules depended on, some of them with three or four or more variants. The approved file for all the combinations was like several megabytes and the test took quite a few minutes to execute. So it wasn't really ideal, but it was just about good enough to support some initial refactorings. And once we'd begun to improve the design, we were able to eliminate some of the combinations. And it went down to 30 seconds before too long and got better from there. When you're refactoring legacy code, the primary desiderata that you need are fast tests that are predictive. They'll find your refactoring mistakes. The more writable these tests are, the less time and effort you will spend creating them before you can start refactoring. And that's the important bit. If the design of your code is not composable, then my advice is to just give up on the composable desiderata. Don't try to write normal unit tests for it. Embrace the complexity. Use approval tests with combination approvals. You can get a lot of coverage for very little test code. And in my experience, the gain in writability outweighs the loss of composability. Although you do still need speed. If your combination tests get too slow, then you will have to do some analysis so you can eliminate a few of those combinations. But I think I've shown you, this is the best way to write tests for Gilded Rose. Do you agree? Leave me a comment. Happy coding.